before going into this, I, I think I would need to first explain uh, an acronym that's very important in this context is the, uh, for those who don't know it, maybe many uh, already do, but just as a reminder for everybody, um, I would uh, use the acronym uh, ICF uh, for International Coaching Federation. And yeah, then I would uh, start straight away with uh, questions. I have a few to start in, and uh, uh, lighten up the uh, the panel. Um, one uh, first maybe to start with Elisa since it was the first to be introduced. Um, maybe uh, this question about this, you know, the, the start of the uh, language uh, journey. So uh, we were talking about mindset in the uh, language learning path. And so what, what's the role of the mindset? You know, what the uh, roles uh, play the mindset at the very beginning of the language learning uh, uh, journey? I personally think that having the right mindset when we start uh, learning a language is very important because on one end, it will help us set realistic goals and it will help us understand what we can do in order to 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 stay motivated and uh, yeah because i think at the very beginning we are all very enthusiastic but then we start we meet the we encounter the first the things that we find difficult and some people might get discouraged, which is totally normal. But if we if we have the right mindset in the sense of thinking, reminding ourselves that learning a language is a path and we really don't have to aim perfection because first of all, I don't think that perfection exists unless, okay, we were born with the language and not even in that case. But in general, yeah, having the right mindset help us keep motivated and happy about learning the language, uh, learning the language and uh, having fun with it. Because if we think we ha I have to have the perfect pronunciation, I cannot make mistakes, I don't want to speak unless I know that everything I will be saying is correct. Of course, we never start. So I think I personally think that. Uh, at the beginning, but also later, a very good mindset, a positive mindset, a, a growth um, mindset is very, very important. Thanks for uh, the answer. Um, any of the other panelists that would like to add anything to this? Otherwise, we have already the next Maybe. question ready. Uh, I can add one more thing here. For me, it's very important to look at all goals in our life holistically looking at entire life and then this mindset helps us actually to see our language task or goal uh, how it fits the entire life other areas of our life how can we do it the way that we live our life in full magnificence and we learn a language so this is also quite an important aspect so that if you want sustainable language learning. Yeah, I'd like to echo uh, that as well and say, um, when we talk about motivation, when we talk about mindset and things like that, um, when it comes to the beginning of almost any stage of the language learning process, uh, I think it's very important to understand uh, the individual needs, the individual wants, the individual situations and the idea of of just copying and pasting what you've seen happen in someone else is possibly less useful for most of us then yeah my next question is uh, i'm trying to you know uh, of course i'm a language learning myself and uh, uh i like to think from the perspective of you know the language learner uh, and in this sense, at some point, uh, as everybody else, I think I, I uh, you know, was learning a language for some time, and I reached the level of, um, let's say, satisfaction with the, the level I achieved at that point of time. Either because I was able to speak and have a conversation, things like that. So, 
um, I would call at some point uh, I will reach the so-called level of plateau of my, you know, uh, expectation from from the language learning experience. And so, how how can one even go beyond that? You know, what, how can you keep learning? Uh, yeah, a language also beyond this, you know, first um, feeling of being satisfied you know, and and <laughs> keep going through to the next level. So I comment here, in, in language coaching, we actually have several principles how to help a learner in a plateau or how to help ourselves. So the first thing is actually to revise all the results that we have done for the previous uh, part, for the previous period, with gratitude. It's very important to cultivate gratitude and to really fix those results uh, and reflect upon them. So the second thing is to allow ourselves a change. Uh, we used to learn language a certain way. It used to work for us for a certain period. Now somehow it's not working for us anymore. We feel like we do not see um, the progress this fast way as we used to have. So, uh, and that's totally all right. You should understand that we are in plateau period right now and we need to allow ourselves this change to uh, now to switch to something which brings us pleasure. It might look less effective versus our previous activities, but it's more important to integrate this change and integrate this pleasure. And there are also some uh, supportive thoughts here, which can help my, my supportive belief, which helps me exactly in the plateau period, sounds like the darkest part of the night is just before the dawn. So if I feel like I'm really stuck, I'm in plateau, I do not see the progress uh, when finally uh, I'm going to be fluent, I, I already know that it's, it's, going to, it's going to happen very, very soon. Sometimes it happens within one week. So yes, uh, this could be something that helps. Um, uh, I, I agree and uh, I would like to add that no, like I, I think that reaching a plateau actually means that we are satisfied, partially satisfied with the language. What I would do would be to understand whether I really want to learn more or not, because it depends on what I wanted to do with the language. Maybe I wanted to be able to be conversational, uh, just to be able to talk to people if I live in a certain country, or maybe it's good enough but I don't enjoy learning. So I think integrating, like uh, Anna said, a bit more fun in the learning process. And uh, I think that probably if we reach a plateau, a plateau is also because it's already the phase where we can integrate language learning into our life. So fine, uh, and it helped me find, uh, when I find, uh, activities that I can that I really like like reading a book or talking to people or maybe yoga class or whatever but in my life so in that language and uh, experiment with what gives me more pleasure in learning the language and as I said at the very beginning under understand whether I really need to learn more so it's not compulsory, but if I want to remind myself why I want to improve, and I think I will feel more motivated. Not really any notes on that um, to follow. So <laughs> I would just agree and say that um, it was, it, if you can already do what you aim to do or you need to do, then I, I'm actually a believer that the plateau doesn't really exist. There are two definitions of plateau exactly that what we probably yeah. need to now uh, say that one is intermediate plateau probably which uh, the one which uh, Richard is now mentioning mm -hmm. is that the one? Yeah. So the intermediate plateau, it, I don't, I don't feel really exists. I think we we just have a feeling of coasting in our language learning, as in we just do enough to keep what we've already learned in our heads and we're not actually pushing ourselves to learn more. And so the idea of I'm still studying, I'm still studying, what we actually forget is 
in the beginning, you make this huge leap, right? From zero to A1, then to A2 is, is actually quite a steep learning curve because you're going from knowing nothing to being able to talk about a little bit about yourself, about your family, your friends, your your plans, about you know what you like to do when you do it, all of these kinds of things and ask basic questions of people. So you're going from nothing to, to a, a conversation, right? A basic conversation. But then when you get to from sort of the A2 level that we talk about through B1 to B2, you're expanding uh, your vocabulary to talk about different topics. And this is where the feeling of, of coasting sometimes sits in, sets in because you're not na naturally going to be drawn to learning the vocabulary you need for all types of topics. Thing is, is that if, if you have in your head that you have to be at this crazily high level in a language for whatever reason, you know, whether it's C1, C2, whatever it is, and you may have valid reasons for that, you may just see it because that's the thing that people do. But it feels like you're you're plateauing and you're not making any any progress. Well, that's more to do with the fact that in order to compound and compact the things that you've already learned, you have to keep repeating it. And the more you have to keep repeating and cycling through, the longer it takes to do that. So the time investment is actually more to drive that whole set of language that you've learned at the A1, A2, then B1 levels to drive that further forward just takes a lot more effort because you're having to repeat and add and make your language more sophisticated too. So I think that's the feeling that we get because it takes longer, there's more inertia. And I can comment here that this is one definition of plateau that many of us have in our heads. And another plateau is just, we set our goal, we know exactly what we want this language for. We have exactly uh, broke down the goal, we know what we want. And first we have very fast visible results. And then at a certain moment, there are no more fast results and we are somewhere on the way to that goal. We are not yet there. And then, uh, and then this is the plateau I was talking actually about. And there, there is one more important thing there, actually the crucial one is um, it's very important in the period of plateau not to fall down uh, in the feeling of guilt. Because once we have guilt here that, oh my God, uh, I didn't learn something, I didn't reach my goal or something. So it brings us so deep down that we almost do not have chance to get out of it soon and continue learning a language and uh, reach our goal. So that's why it's very important to go for probably a, a coaching session with a language coach or uh, to work with, with ourselves if we are able to do so, just to revise all the good things that we have done through gratitude, without guilt. But, but, but if we have guilt, it's quite hard to uh, work it through and change it for some better emotions with better energy. Because guilt is also killing pleasure. Once we have guilt, pleasure is not possible. That's the psychological press process here. And we need pleasure. We need pleasure to, to, to continue learning. So one more aspect here. So then for the answers, everybody. And um, yeah, I would go on with my next question. Uh, it was mentioned uh, earlier, um, yeah, uh, um, that especially when when you start learning but i think that's true also uh, in in all steps of the uh, language learning path um many people me included <laughs> uh you know we we need to overcome that that fear of of making the mistake right and maybe for the first time and that that's usually uh associated with a certain level of anxiety about that right and um, um, so, uh, well, you know, what, what can the mindset, the right mindset do, or how to achieve uh, the right mindset, uh, to, you know, overcome the, this, this level of fear and, and go beyond that and be able to, yeah, just have a, you know, um, uh, nicer and or better, uh, experience with, with the language we are learning at that time. Uh, I think I wanted to ask this question first to, to uh, I wanted to give Elisa the chance to answer first. 
and then the others of course can can add uh, their own comments and uh, remarks on that later if that's okay with everybody thank you this is a topic i really love because i think that I, okay i cannot uh, speak for everyone but i think this is a very common thing to the fear of making mistakes and uh, I'm also afraid of making mistakes. It's not that I think it's totally normal to be afraid of making mistakes. The important thing is to to realize that first of all, mistakes are part of life. And uh, I really one of my favorite uh, quotes, and I think it's also in my political gathering profile, is if you are not failing or making mistakes, it's because you are not trying hard enough. So when when I when I just say things that I already know, for example, when I don't make the effort of making my sentences a bit more complicated, adding more words or trying to to make a longer uh, sentence, it's when I cannot grow because I just use what I already know, which is good on one end, but how can I improve? So I really think that making mistakes is the key but also like improving our mindset in the sense that mistakes are a very important part of the uh, language learning path. And in general, I often remind my students to, to think about two things. The first one is that if I'm at a party and I'm talking to people, uh, let's say that someone talks to me in Italian. Do I like them? Uh, do I like them less because they make mistakes? No. And if I talked to someone and this person didn't like me because I make mistakes, especially in social <laughs> uh, environments, I don't need this person to be my friend because then this person is very judgmental. So to relax. And uh, maybe that, that can also be a kind of friend screening. So you know who you want to talk to. And the second thing for me that is very important to me that I also tell my students uh, is that uh, also in a work environment, in most cases, unless you are an interpreter or sometimes I joke and they say a spy, what we need is not perfection, is to be able to, to do our job at our best. And that doesn't necessarily depend on making some mistakes when we speak. I've worked in companies, not as a language teacher, really like in different fields in companies. And I didn't, and I could work in so many languages. So it didn't have to be perfect, but I could do, when you are an expert in your field, for example, when, I don't know, if you're a project manager, if you are, whatever the, your field is, if you know, or, for example, I have a friend who is a social uh, media manager and she's afraid of making mistakes, but at the same time, she's such an expert that she can speak about it and would be completely understandable. So there is no problem. So mistakes, in my, from my point of view, are welcome and uh, more than welcome. And uh, it's something that is really an obstacle for most people, because I think somehow, maybe our parents, maybe uh, ourselves, we decided that perfection is the goal, but perfection is not the goal, I think. I think, Enjoying the process is the goal, and achieving achieving our language goal in terms of what we want to be able to do with the language. If we are learning a language because we want a job, it's good enough to be able to, to do the job in that language. Perfection is normally our enemy. Send the same question to the others. So if they want to add something to this, fear of mistakes was the topic here. I can add two components here. One is that if we fear making mistakes, then we probably uh, fear judgment. And here we can integrate some perspective that actually 
no one is judging us. When people, when it feels like someone is judging, they're just talking about their, themselves, about their problematic things, not about us, actually. Anything a person is talking about or anyone a person is talking about, anyway, this person is talking about themselves at this moment. So it's not connected about us. No one is judging us and we can um, allow ourselves to do so many mistakes uh, that we need. And actually a mistake is a, a very ergonomic way to learn because when we do a mistake, when we make a mistake and we get corrected, we understand the correct option at this moment, there is so much focus. So we learn it. And we don't need to repeat and repeat and repeat with this mistake. We, we have already learned it. So there's no mistakes. There are learnings. But yes, of course, it's deep inside of us. It's not enough just to say, say it out loud. There is no mistake. We, there are on, only learnings. Because it's so deep and we learned to feel that we are judged long, long ago. Sometimes it's a good thing to take it as a topic for our therapist and uh, just get rid of it. We also remember that people who speak these languages that you're learning also make mistakes against the standard language that you're trying to learn. And that's a very normal thing to happen as well, even for first language speakers. In fact, it's through these mistakes that we have in our language that languages can change and evolve. And so we have new words that form, new items of grammar, new types of expressions, things that didn't exist in the language before. So you never know. Some of the mistakes you're making while you're learning a language might be ones that are the new evolution of the language and you just don't know yet. Relate a lot to all what you uh, just said. Um, yeah, I would uh, um, like to go on to um, and introduce maybe another topic to the, uh, this discussion. Um, uh, yeah, for example, one that comes to mind is the is the beliefs, right? Um, the power that, that uh, strong beliefs, or yeah, not maybe not necessarily strong, but beliefs. Have on the on the uh, language acquisition, right? Um, I, I'm thinking to cases, for example, such as I don't know. I heard many times, I'm too old to learn a language, or I, if I don't do a certain thing, I will not be able to learn a language in this, uh, x amount of time. Or you know, if I don't do x, I won't be able to uh, whatever else, right? So limiting beliefs so they impact us. Um, and the uh, language acquisition, of course, in the, <laughs> many other cases in life. So in particular, to, to the case of uh, language learning, is there a way, and if so, how can we transform this from you know, being a problem to being a gift, from being something that limits us to something that we can use um, you know, on the way of uh, learning the language? I think I would like to give the uh, chance to Anna, in this case, to answer first, and then maybe the others can follow. Thank you. Of course, this is one of my favorite topics. And even I'm now uh, holding a set of beliefs, limiting ones. We got 62, like most common ones. And the other side contains supportive perspective, even several types of supportive perspectives for each uh, negative belief. And of course, what we believe in, these things we get, in, it, and it's not only about the result, it's also about the process. If we believe that uh, learning a language is a very hard, long, exhausting process, it's going to be like that for us. And the tricky part here is to recognize our limiting beliefs because it's part of our life and uh, we do not question it. So for that reason, it's very good to be in an environment with people who think differently, who are successful in those topics where we are not so, so successful and see the way they approach this question. Or to go to a coaching session again and uh, the coach 
has all the competences competences to notice their limiting beliefs and to put them on the table so that the client is aware of them and then start transforming. So um, a limiting belief is something uh, very deep within us. So probably just, uh, uh, well, I have right now a small issue. Uh, if I can uh, ask Elisa to continue on this topic because I need one minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. sure. That's, okay. that's, uh, well, yes. yes, Elisa, please. Okay. Uh, I think that most of us are aware of limiting beliefs, of our limiting beliefs. But I think not all of us or not all of us on all, about all these limiting beliefs are aware of how much, to which extent they are holding us um, from what we want to achieve. Because maybe I might know, okay, I'm my limiting belief is maybe if I'm not mine personally, but I have many others. Okay. If my limiting beliefs, uh, belief is if I don't do things perfectly, it's better I don't do them. If it's my limiting belief, then I mm -hmm. might I might know that I'm a perfectionist, for example, but it does uh, maybe I don't know how much this one uh, this thing is uh, is preventing me from enjoying the learning process and be happier in my life. And this is why I think either working with a coach or trying to see what is really holding us back is a very good option so that we work on our, our limited beliefs so that, okay, we, we don't have to eliminate them, but we, we it's very, very important that we are aware of them in the sense that normally we escape from pain and we go towards pleasure. So this is why it's important to understand, okay, but through, if I keep thinking it this way, instead of preventing bad things to happen, so like, I don't want to suffer because of, I don't want to see that I'm not perfect. I don't want to see that uh, whatever mistake I can make. To remind uh, you, ourselves that not doing something normally brings more pain than joy, I think. Taking risks is what makes us grow and makes us proud of ourselves. Thanks for stepping in uh, as well, also for the uh, answer. Anna, uh, are you back with us yeah, now? I think I had some, uh, some urgent situation here. Thank you very much, Elisa. So uh, maybe just uh, a, a few examples. Uh, once we change our beliefs, what uh, what changes? Uh, so for example, we can think that certain nationality doesn't like our nationality, and we need to learn this language because we came to that country. And then uh, what happens? We often have those people who are not very nice in our environment confirming our negative belief. Yes, exactly, those people are like that. They are not actually so warm and welcoming. But once we at least try to find examples of very nice people, representatives of that country, of that language, of that nationality, and uh, we can engage some people here who help us to find those examples, and this, uh, this way we start changing, okay, so not all people are so uh, bad towards myself. And then we start attracting more and more positive examples. And then we start changing the whole belief. And then the whole learning of the language is uh, uh, faster, nicer, and um, we enjoy it. That's one of the examples, how we can approach that. And, and of course, there are many, many more. I, I need to um and I, it's a pleasure to forward this question from the audience specific to um the cards that that you showed earlier um somebody asked how they can get access to uh, those cards on the limiting beliefs and so yeah if maybe you want to explain this now if if probably, um, uh, what is the way to contact us? We have the contacts right uh, here on the Polyglot Gathering 
please contact me and I will give all the information about that. Um, yeah, so the next question I have um, is now, you know, um, yeah, trying to like create um, parallel or, or let's say try to understand the relationship between the um, mindset and the learning strategies in, in general. Um, so what are, you know, the, the most common, I will put it in this way, what are the most common obstacles on, on the way to adopting the right mindset? Um, sorry. Uh, the, <laughs> um, the most common mindset obstacles in, in um, you know, adopting the uh, most effective strategy in the learning path. Uh, if you had experience with with some of this, maybe you could uh, try to you know, uh, yeah give also some examples of uh, the most common mindset uh, related obstacles to to adopt a strategy in particular. I think that we talked about this topic when we mm. talked about uh, limiting beliefs and uh, and fear of making mistakes. So. Yeah, so and that is the most common. There these any... are the most common. And the other one that I think is very common is that sometimes we are not aware of the fact that uh, deep down we are not sure we can succeed. And I think it's very important that we work on that because there was a very nice uh, quote. I cannot really, uh, I cannot remember it uh, like 100%, but the, the, the meaning is that the, whether you believe that something is possible or not, you are right. And uh, because it's it starts from us. If we believe we can do it, so why do children, for example, fall from the bike and do it over and over again? Because they just believe they can do it. And when, when we believe we cannot do it, we will stop. So I think this is also a very important point. I love it. And also in coaching, we have five key principles, the way we approach um, working in coaching. And one of them is that uh, it's enough that we get the wish. If we have the wish for ourselves, then we have all the fundamental resources to fulfill that wish. The only thing we need is to activate those resources, find them, see probably some obstacles are not uh, helping us to see those resources and how then we work with those obstacles to activate the potential the resources. But it's already enough that we want it. If we want it, 100%, we can do that. That's very helping in many, many spheres of life. I agree. The um, no real notes either again. Um, I see from childhood we start to become more aware of the people around us from about the age of seven and those relationships with our peers become more and more important and so we are more self-conscious of how we act and who we are and what we do and um we get criticism from our peers because children are also learning to communicate so sometimes the lack of filter can be more hurtful than it can be from certainly a more filtered critique of what we're doing and who we are and all those things so we start to build up walls and we start to look at how we project the image that we want to be seen of ourselves and we see that reflected in modern day technologies like profiles on Instagram and wherever else and so sometimes we're emulating something that doesn't actually exist and um Deconstructing some of these things can be quite crucial, really, in being able to get over mindsets and therefore reinterpret motivation and reinterpret goals so that they fit into your own individual, unique lifestyle and situation. Yeah, I think there is a, um, a question in the in the chat that makes me think about one of the questions I had in my list. I mean, it's the Maybe what's the difference between an adult person and the and the young person? Um, yeah, and implementing the right the right um, mindset. In this case, the question was about the, the fear of making mistakes, right? 
I mean, but uh, apart from uh, this, uh, I mean, specifically to this, but also not necessarily. Uh, yeah, yeah, what's the, in your experience, the difference in, in, um, yeah, in um, adopting the right mindset between adults and, and, um, and children? If you would like to expand on the topic, I think partially Richard already covered this, but maybe we want to expand more on this also with you. Well, I can comment, uh, but let me know when you say, or Richard, if you want. So, so uh, what is important uh, uh, about child approach? There is so much energy, there is so much curiosity, and that energy helps us to learn very, very, very fast. And when we grow up, we have been a child without, within ourselves. This is a transaction analysis of soft personalities, parent, adult, and a child within us. But adults, what all, what very often do, they suppress the inner child. And for learning, we need this curiosity. We need this inner child driving us to go and learn. So probably about that. Yeah, I completely agree. And the other thing I would like to add, but really already on what you just said, is that I think an adult can emulate this children uh, curiosity in a way that, for example, they stop thinking about, I have to learn, I have to do that, I have, and start doing whatever they want to be doing. If I if my aim is speaking and I only uh, and I allow myself to start speaking one or two years after I start learning a language, of course, I will not find it so exciting. So less scary, sure, but not so exciting. The reason why children learn so fast is because they're not thinking, OK, I'm learning. They're concentrating on doing. And if we concentrate, if we focus on doing, then we can also learn fast because we will not focus on our fear of making mistakes. We will just try to get better at what we love. And I think it's an important part of the learning process if we want to enjoy it. The, the, the idea often we have in our heads is that we have perfect recollection of what it was like to be a child and how we learned and how much we can do. And it's in fact one of the limiting beliefs that we see almost as a positive thing of what we can do when we're working on maximum effort. But we forget everything that was going on around that. So as a child, your goal is to learn uh, from the very beginning, right? You're learning your first language, you're maybe another language, but it's not in the same way as you do as an adult because you're making mistakes in everything <laughs> from the very beginning. And you you almost forget and you make many of them and the same ones over and over again um but because everyone's doing the same thing as a child as well it's kind of like oh, that's pretty normal most people are doing that and then as we get older and we want to project this image of yeah i do things well now. i've been through that pattern and i've been through all of these steps so i should therefore be doing this really really well at this point and if i don't i'm a failure at some on some level and so you get to this stage of you forget what it was to learn. You forget why you learned what you learned and you come at a new language and you think that you're doing it less well than a child, for example, and children seem to learn it effortlessly. Well, they don't. It's just that they don't have the same tools. You forgot the pain barriers you went through to get those tools that you have, like reading fluently, like writing fluently, like concepts that exist in your own language that just are not there for a child yet if you imagine the child's world is very very different it's very much fixed on what they're doing the, the here and now the things that are in their field of vision the things they can imagine but for us we've got terms that are just so etherical that they don't even come into the consciousness of a child in an, in a very tangible way and so we forget all of this stuff that we did as children and we, but we still put the pressure on ourselves as having learned that effortlessly and having learned that quickly because we remember that test we did when we focused solely on that test. We didn't have a job. We didn't have anything else to do. We didn't have any, we had people cooking our meals for us. We had so little else going on. 
but we focused on that test and we got 100%. And now we set that benchmark, not just as our best, but we set that as what we can do. And we allow ourselves to believe that that should be our norm. And these weird uh, perversions of the reality that was, because our, our memory is never perfect in these matters, allow us to really block our own learning as adults. And this is where children don't have that because they're not at that stage in their development. Yeah, and uh, if I may uh, add a very, a very small thing, sometimes people say, oh, children learn so fast. And sometimes I say, okay, but if you went to school in a foreign country and you had to be there four or five hours a day, I think after uh, nine months, your level would also be good. And they go there not because it's their choice, it's because we tell them that they have to go to that school and start with a new language and they know nothing about, for example, when parents move to another country. So I think for sure children have this curiosity that is really an advantage. But at the same time, I think if any adult focus more on having fun, and not really thinking and about all this pressure and so on, I think they would achieve the same results and partially even better just because they know what they want and they know why they are doing it for. I can't agree more. And uh, this having fun is actually child energy. And also gamification is a very cool tool here to turn on this child energy curiosity while knowing uh, all our strengths from adult, knowing what we want to uh, to get uh, in the end. And that's why actually I am uh, the master of play technology of transformational games, because this is the entrance into this uh, child energy combining with all the other powers that we have. Thanks for uh, these last comments. And uh, I think we are at time and I would love this to keep going. Uh, and uh, ask you many more questions, but I think we really have to uh, close this session now. Uh, again, uh, thanks uh, uh, to the uh, speakers, uh, Elisa and, and Richard. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here with you guys. And uh, yeah. uh, thanks to everybody who joined the uh, panel discussion and for all those who asked questions, I tried to, uh, yeah, uh, transmit them to the speakers uh, as uh, I could. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much. And please, I don't know, feel free to reach out to us if you want to keep in contact. Uh, and, and if you have more questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh.